All right, welcome back, day three. Now, you may be wondering, Ryan, that doesn't look like the stormy sea behind you. What happened? Well, I thought you guys might get sick of the stormy sea backgrounds. So instead, today I give you any guesses? Any guesses where this is relevant to our story? That is Fairhaven's Crete, the place that the sailors decided wasn't good enough to winter in when Paul said, guys, we should stay here, They're, or it's going to go really badly. Now, I'll let you see it again, and then we'll take a vote. How many of you would winter there? Would you mind spending a vacation here? I would. I'd, I'd love to spend a winter there. That sounds great. But they chose not to. Anyways, let's begin. So where we left off yesterday, we'd arrived at a bit of an unsettling point, hadn't we? Where we learned that this god who pursued Paul even when he was a bad guy and loved him enough to do that, uh, the assurance that he's giving Paul isn't assurance that he's not going to have hard times or storms in his life. And we also learned that we can't be good enough to like earn our way out of bad times in life. And we're not smart enough to plan our way around them because we might think a nice south wind means we should keep sailing and then a nor'easter comes and blows us out into the middle of the ocean. Which is not a great place to be. Today, hopefully, we'll start building back some encouragement. So, let's dig in. Picking up in Acts, the book about things that the early followers of Jesus did soon after he ascended to heaven, continues the story. And our, our sailors and Paul and our Roman soldiers are all out at sea in the storm for multiple days, and they've chucked everything overboard, including the sails and the ropes for steering the ship. So, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Everybody, let's just say, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Captain Hindsight. Uh, have your parents ever told you it's not nice to say I told you so? Yeah, Paul is saying I told you so. This is a good reminder of what he said to his buddies in Rome last time, that all have sinned and fallen short of, and, you know. Yeah, that includes Paul. Uh, he shouldn't be saying I told you so, but he is. Good reminder, though, that he's a human like us. Yet now I, Paul, urge you to take heart. He's encouraging them, that's nice. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, that's in Rome. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on some island. This is kind of cool what's going on here, right? Paul is being given more assurance from God, like he was on day one when he was standing before the council and God said, it's going to be okay, I'll get you to Rome. God is saying, still going to get you to Rome. But now he's also pursuing, giving assurance to the other sailors on the boat through Paul. Sailors who don't even believe that God is a God, don't even believe he exists. He's pursuing them before they're pursuing him. If that sounds familiar. That takes us back to day one. Who is Paul's God? Somebody who loves people so much that he pursues them even when they're not pursuing him even when they're enemies of him. He is giving them assurance. He's acting in their lives. He's pursuing them. Pretty cool, right? Now the gif or jif, depending on your school of thought of how to pronounce movable pictures or moving pictures, is meant to just remind you that they are still in the middle of the storm. There's no place in this passage here where it says the storm lessened and Paul said this. They are still in the middle of the storm. Well, I'll leave it to you to figure out how much you think they took Paul's encouragement to heart. But let's read on. Oh, before we read on, notice this little detail too. God has granted you all those who sail with you, the angel says to Paul. God has granted to Paul, which I think means Paul was praying for these guys. Paul was praying for these guys who didn't listen to him in Fair Havens. Paul was praying for guys who are watching over him as a prisoner. Uh, people who don't know that, Paul was praying for them too. Kind of imitating his God who pursues people before they're, you know, before they're pursuing him. So we read on, and it says, when the 14th night had come, 
14 nights of being in a storm in the middle of the sea. Pause for a moment. What's the biggest, longest thunderstorm you've ever been in? I'm from South Florida. I've played football in hurricanes. Hurricanes are like three, four, maybe five days of thunderstorms. 14 days of thunderstorm straight. So when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding, that's checking how deep the water is, and found 20 fathoms. That's not that deep. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. That's even less deep, so it's getting shallower. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. They're hoping to run aground because they can't steer their ship. The only way they'll ever stop is if they smash into rocks or run aground on some sand. Which one would you prefer? Smash into rocks, run aground on some sand. They're hoping for the latter. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, ah, pay attention here. As the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea, the ship's boat is like the rowboat that you go from the big ship to the shore. They lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense, the lie of laying out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, whoa, 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 unless these men stay in the ship, you can't be saved. Cut away the, boat, the ship's boat and let it go. Interesting, right? Paul's given them all assurance, but they have to trust God's rescue, not their own ideas. And the sailors, so not the soldiers, not the prisoners that are on the ship, the sailors are thinking, okay, we're going to sneak away on the only boat that can be steered. We're going to get ourselves out of here. Paul's saying, no, that's not how it works. You've got to trust God if you want to be rescued here. Very interesting, huh? They're all in this together. A tragic bit of me trying to be current, by the way. I thought, oh, high school musical. Look how young and hip I am. That was the big day camp thing in 2007. So none of, not many of you were even born then. So swing and a miss on my part. But eh, kind of a nice miss on you guys. It wasn't that good. But Zach Efron's cool now. So this leads us into a little bit more of an understanding of what exactly Paul's God is providing and what this Jesus's role is within that. Because Paul sometimes says, I belong to God. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. And they're kind of interchangeable because theologically, to jump way ahead, we do believe they are part of the same person, which is God. And yet there's kind of different aspects to them. And we can figure out a little bit more from now going to one of Paul's letters, specifically the one he wrote to his buddies in, in Rome. And in there, he dropped this line, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's unpack that a little. For the wages of sin is death. Sin, the best way I put it to my five-year-old is sad choices. Choices that hurt ourselves, choices that hurt others, choices that are selfish. And these choices, they have consequences. Often in this life, they have consequences. If you lie to a friend and they find out, that friend won't trust you. You might lose that friend. But there's also consequences later on. Paul, in the first passage we looked at, said, I can stand in good conscience before my God. And many people, most people, I would say, believe they will stand before someone after this life. They will be judged. And his conscience is clear. And our sad choices have consequences in that, in that judging scenario that a lot of people picture. So there's consequences in this life, consequences in the next life as well. And when he says the wages of sin is death, I don't think he means if you make a sad choice in this world, you're going to die in the storm, but rather that these consequences are going to lead you to not having a happy experience in that afterlife judgment. The second half of the sentence, though, says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. First of all, notice it's a gift. We don't earn it by being good. We don't earn it because we're so clever. And sometimes it would feel better if we did. But rather, it's given to us. We accept it. We receive it. We don't earn it. We don't calculate a way to get it but it's eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's rescue from those consequences, from the death of sin. There are consequences 
especially in the next life and even sometimes in this life, we're rescued from those in Jesus. So Jesus is God's rescuer that God sent to this world. When I quoted Jesus, that's because Jesus became a dude and came to this world and said stuff and had buddies and ate and drank and like he lived like we did. And God had him come and live to rescue us. When we accept God's gift, we're rescued in Jesus. We are given assurance and help and peace now. Uh, Paul has been given assurance twice. When God says, you're going to stand before Rome in the middle of a storm, the assumption is that God's going to do something to make sure that happens, that Paul doesn't drown. And Jesus, in the quote we saw last time, said, I have said these things so that you may have peace despite the fact that there's going to be storms, despite the fact that this life will have hard times, I want you to have peace in me during this life. So that's some of the assurance and the rescue that we get now through this Jesus character, this Jesus figure. But also later on, if Paul can stand in clear conscience before God, I think we'd all love to do that. However, we imagine this being judged for the choices we made after our lives. Well, that's where Jesus is promising eternal life, life without pain, without sadness. Sounds quite nice, right? So to track our questions here, we start off asking, who is Paul's God? Someone who loves him and us, pursues him and us, and gives him assurance. The problem is that assurance doesn't mean we won't have hard times in our lives. It doesn't mean we won't make sad choices. But who is Jesus in all this? He's God's to gift to us. A rescuer. And then tomorrow we'll pick up with how exactly he did that rescue and what that rescue looks like for us. Looking forward to it. I'll see you guys tomorrow.